Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Jonathan Bennett joins me. We're going to be talking about Flutter. It's a great way to develop for both iOS and Android without writing two separate code bases. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Jonathan Bennett. Episode 439, recorded June 20th, 2017. Flutter. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Cloudflare. More than 6 million websites, apps, APIs, and software-as-a-service companies use Cloudflare services to weather whatever the Internet throws at them. For a free online chat session with a Cloudflare support engineer, visit cloudflare.com slash twit. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open-source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at StoneEdge.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, little projects, projects you may be using every day and totally unaware of it, projects you might want to download and play with right after this show. Today is probably one of those. Joining me once again is Jonathan Bennett. Jonathan, welcome back to the show. Thank you. On our last Tuesday taping, I might add, good to be here. Yes, yes, and it's been so long since we've had you on a show. What is it, like uh, seven days? <laughs> seven whole days. I can't believe it. <laughs> I know. I know. But you have a particular, um, you have a particular uh, area of interest of that, brought, <laughs> that, that have brought you back. But before we do that, I, I kind of want to explain for people who are watching the video or maybe if there's any audio dropouts. That I am in a hotel room about two blocks from the U.S. and Patent and Trademark Office, USPTO, in Washington, D.C., the Pearl Conference is going on this week. And so I've been here attending all the sessions and attending all the parties and talking up uh, things uh, of what I'm working on these days, which includes Dart and Flutter. And uh, that leads me directly to uh, what we're going to be talking about today, because today this show actually is about Flutter. Now, let me sort of give me the, I'll give you the 30,000 foot view here. And then uh, when we bring on our guest, uh, Adam Barth, just a few minutes, uh, I will. Uh, we'll see how close I actually came. So here's the key point about Flutter: mobile is important now. iOS and Android, un- unfortunately, because of their came from separate organizations, they require a completely different development environment, a completely different uh, design. I mean, iOS is all about Objective C and now Swift. Uh, Android side is all about Java and uh, now Kotlin. But the problem is then you had to create two different teams of developers if you wanted to be on all the mobile platforms. And mobile is huge these days. I mean, if you don't have a mobile app for your uh, for your uh, website, you know, for it so people can actually get to you on the go, it's so much harder to do business and engage uh, with, with people. So what, uh, what Google has decided to do, and we'll actually talk to Adam about how this all came about, is create a single platform written in the Dart language, which we've talked about at least a couple times on this previous sh- uh, on previous shows from here, and uh, use it to write code that uh, implements its own widgets all the way down to just about bare metal. And what that means is that you can write your code once in Dart, deploy it on iOS, and deploy it on Android. And not only can you do that, that's actually already been done for some applications. So it's it's already in production, although they still call it alpha, you know, be careful. But, you know, hey, Google's alpha code seems to be better than most of my production code, so I'm really not going to worry too much about that. Uh, uh, what do you know about this so far, Jonathan? So I, I know very little about it. I'm looking forward to learning it, uh, le- learning about it, and hopefully learning it. Um, I, I do know that... You, you mentioned earlier that I have a, a particular interest, and all that came to mind is I, I have a particular set of skills. <laughs> but I, I, do have it, I do have an Android app that we, we really would like to see an iOS version, and uh, sounds like this might be a very interesting way to achieve that goal. So I will be plugged in and learning with, <clears throat> with everybody else. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and part of my excitement in preparing for this show is I actually finally downloaded Flutter because I figured I'll never do mobile. I was mostly looking at Dart and, uh, Angular, and Angular and doing SPAs. But I downloaded the Flutter framework and the, the Flutter uh, collection of tools. And within about 20 minutes after some fidgeting, 
I was I had I finally fired up the iOS simulator. I actually had a simulated mobile phone on my screen and I was editing the code and changing things immediately on the screen. That we gotta talk about this hot reload thing. That's definitely gonna be a big 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 point in the show. Of course, you know, Adam can tell us all about that. But I, the same thing with Android. I actually downloaded the Android development uh, kit and I had that exact same application running without changing a single line of code running on Android. This has me very excited. Well, We'll get ring Adam on in just a minute, but I do have an important message before we go there. Because this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Cloudflare. Cloudflare is on a mission to help build a better internet. Cloudflare makes your site or app faster, more reliable, so you can stop worrying about slow loading page times, downtime, or getting hacked. Cloudflare is incredibly easy to use, and sign-up takes less than five minutes. Cloudflare's global network of 115-plus data centers caches your content and moves it closer to visitors. Their web optimization features speed up your code and make it mobile responsive. End-to-end, Cloudflare speeds up every request to your site with performant DNS, caching, content optimization, load balancing, and more. Your Cloudflare doesn't only provide DDoS protection, their web application firewall is powered by a massive IP reputation that updates for all users. Cloudflare's security team is constantly watching for new vulnerabilities and deploying real-time protection. No matter what you choose for your cloud compute, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, a combination of public or hybrid, Cloudflare works for all of them. Using Cloudflare gives your business the option to use more than one cloud provider so you don't get locked into any of them. If you're hit with a DDoS attack or your site suddenly experiences a surge in legitimate traffic, you pay the same flat amount. Plans range from free, $20 a month, $200 a month, and custom plans for enterprises. Cloudflare is offering Twit listeners a free online chat session with one of their top support engineers to answer any of your questions. Visit cloudflare.com slash twit to sign up today. That's cloudflare.com slash twit. And we thank Cloudflare for their support of Floss Weekly. Let's go ahead and bring in our guest, Adam Barth. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. And where are you speaking to us from? This is the Google Developer Studio in Mountain View. Awesome. It looks brilliant. I, I, and I've heard you've got actually got two camera operators behind the scenes there. I never get that privilege as I'm out here doing this thing in the field. So so how did I do it? Did I describe uh, the big 30,000-foot view of uh, Flutter uh, fairly accurately? Yeah, so that's just about right, yeah. Okay, I should ask you a yes or no question. So t- tell me, what <laughs> what is it, what problem is this solving? Uh, I think I alluded to a couple items about that, but maybe I'm missing some of the scope. What there must be a bigger problem that this is actually even taking care of as well. Yeah, I mean the core problem is is developer productivity. So if you have a team of mobile developers, you actually have two teams writing two separate apps, which means you have to duplicate a lot of effort. And we thought, well, maybe if you combine those teams into one team, then you could uh, do more. And actually. Part of doing that is we um, uh, modernize the, the mobile frameworks. So a lot of mobile frameworks that people are using today are either built on web technology or built on frameworks that were created like 10 years ago. So we thought, well, this is an opportunity to rethink how that's done. And we built a modern framework from top to bottom that, that we think is actually pretty good. So what can you tell us about the history of Flutter? How did it get started? So it got started as an experiment where we took a, uh, the WebView technology and said, well, WebView is constrained to have to render web pages because that's what it does, and spent many years optimizing the web rendering engine in Chrome and thought, well, what would happen if we took away the constraint of having to render web pages and just broke every compatibility thing we could imagine? And so we did a little experiment, and in a week we got some pretty significant performance gains. We thought, okay, maybe there's something here. And so then we took that, that experiment and over several years refined it and eventually out came Flutter. And was it uh, originally, I mean, how did Dart come into the equation? Yeah, so originally it was in JavaScript, and there was a a very large DOM component that was implemented in C++, similar to how a web browser works. And as we were Mm -hmm. working on things, we realized that that really wasn't all that necessary. And if instead you picked a language like Dart that you could compile down to native code, then you didn't need the C++ layer, and we could lift all that mechanism that in a browser is, is baked in and expose it to developers and make it much more powerful. So developers could reach in and subclass anything in the whole stack, all the way down from the widgets to the rendering layer to the compositing layer. The whole stack is available for developers to customize and build beautiful fluid UIs out of. 
and I, I think this is an important point to make because we're making this already pretty early on, is that this is really compiling down to actual native code, uh, to ARM code, uh, uh, running on the, the, two, the two platforms. And one of the things I think that mi that's important about that, and you can uh, expand on this if I if I miss I'm missing something, but you know instead of rewriting your app so that it works with DOM elements and then has activity based on JavaScript, you're actually talking about writing the same sort of code, although in Dart, that you would have written in Java on Android and uh, Objective C on the iOS side. Is that is that a fair cups fair uh, take? Yeah, that, yes, that's correct. So it's structured um, in many ways like other uh, mobile frameworks like Cocoa or like the Android framework, where you have a, a language that you're writing in and that drills all the way down to the the GPU and either either outputs uh, OpenGL or outputs Vulkan, depending on the capabilities of your device. Okay, so if I'm an existing iOS developer or I'm an existing Android developer, uh, what's going to be different about my workflow? Is it still pretty much talking to an IDE and pushing a button at some point and watching it on my simulator and then deploying it to my uh, hardware app? Yeah, the basic flow is very similar, but we've accelerated it. So with the hot reload feature, it, the sort of as you type, you can click this one button, and in less than a second, your app live updates and sees. Uh, you can see the code change you've made, and in fact, it keeps all of your state. So, for example, if you have an animation running while you're editing the code, your app will change, and the animation will continue to run to completion with your new code in there. And part of the way this works is because the framework is built on this uh, functional reactive paradigm, where you explain what you want the UI to look like, and the framework takes care of taking the, the UI from its current state to that state, you only have to explain the target state, and the hot reload can change your app from wherever it was, even some state that no longer exists in the code, to the state that you've described. And so talk a little bit more about this reactive framework. Is this, a, is, are, is this same sort of reactive in the word like React and React Native? Uh, yes, it's similar in, in structure to React.js and React Native. The, in this in the style of the framework, in the sense that you have a, we call it a build function, I think React calls it a render function, but same idea, where you sort of describe the structure of what you're, you want your UI to be. Uh, what happens after that is a bit different than in React Native. So in React Native, those then get translated down to uh, constructing OEM views, so either views that were written by Apple or views that came with your Android phone. Uh, in Flutter, you describe what you want in the sort of reactive framework, and that gets built all the way down to the middle. Hey, I want to jump in for a couple of questions if I can. So um, Android work has been done in Java pretty much as long as Android has been around. Is Flutter and Dart looking to move Java to, to legacy status? Are you guys trying to actually replace it altogether? I think it's solving different problems. So different teams have different problems. If you want to create purely an Android app and you have no interest in iOS or anything like that, then you know Java or Kotlin is a good solution for you. If you're looking to create something that runs on both Android and iOS and you want to do so more efficiently than implementing it twice, once in Java and once in Swift, then Flutter might be a good choice for you. So are there, are there some tools? Is there a, a path lined out to be able to transition an existing app from Java to, uh, to Flutter? Yes, yeah, so you can transition an existing app one screen at a time. It's sort of the easiest way of doing it. Uh, most of our customers are people who are writing uh, new apps or are basically porting existing apps by replacing the whole thing. But I realize that that's not something that you know everyone can do. So you can go screen by screen if you want. So you can you can kind of mix and match Java in some portions of your app with uh, I guess it's Dart in other portions of the app. Those two can play together nicely. Yeah, so in the SDK, there's a thing called a Flutter view, which is where all the sort of Flutter magic happens. And then that view can be placed anywhere in your app that you can put any other Android view or something similar on iOS. So does this de development happen within Android Studio, or is there a, another IDE that's been spun up for, for working with? Yeah, we recommend IntelliJ. So we have a, a nice plugin for IntelliJ that integrates with all of our tools and does debugging and hot reloading and all that kind of stuff. And you can also develop your, uh, yeah, so part of your app is the UI, but you also have a part where you interface with the underlying platform. So we call that a plugin. And so those plugins are written in Java or Objective-C or Swift and or Kotlin, I guess, if you want. And the, you can develop all those from inside IntelliJ in one place. So one of the, and you may have just touched on this, but one of the things that, at least in my development for Android, that I found extremely useful is there is a, is a very large uh, collection of libraries that have already been written 
um, just all kinds of things that you, know, you, you can imagine it and then you go Google for it and there's probably a, a, a library out there that already does it. Um, do those libraries, do those existing libraries play nice with Flutter? Yeah, so through the plugin system, you can plug in any platform-specific code you want, and then there's a little uh, message passing bridge that you use to talk to it. And so you can reuse any library that exists. Now, obviously, if you're using a library that only exists on Android and you want to have the same functionality on iOS, you have to find either an equivalent library or you have to, to fill in that dependency. So, so it's not actually magic. It just seems like it sometimes. <laughs> uh, um so one of one of the things we do in in the app I develop is we we have a an actual C library and we use C plus plus code to call it. Uh, it sounds like, and I'll let you comment on this. It sounds like though that that is something that you guys support as well. Is that correct? So we haven't built a uh, end to end developer workflow for that. That's something that we're looking at supporting in the future. The architecture definitely allows for it. It's just not a path that we've paved at the moment. So for, for us to support that, we would have to continue using uh, Java's, I believe they call it the JNI, if I remember correctly, their, their native code interface, and then just build um, UI elements with Flutter on top of that? That's correct. So we, we've talked about how that Flutter more or less compiles down to native ARM code. Does that mean that it, it inherently runs faster and quicker than, uh, than Java code? Um, we haven't done a lot of comparisons with Java code. So the advantage of compiling down to native code is that you don't have to run any compilation steps on the device. And so you end up using less power. You get more predictable performance, which means your animations run very smoothly. Um, we've mostly been benchmarking against other uh, ways of running code. Uh, this is going to be a little hard to do without actually drawing pictures and stuff. But um, <laughs> the, um, So what does... What, what does the application stack actually look like? I mean, what can you describe it from like, you know, I guess some part of it's actually talking to the OS and at the bottom layer, and then there's something above that. Can you, can you kind of go through what those layers are? Yeah, so maybe I'll start at the top. So at the top, we have a pretty complete set of material okay. design widgets. So we've, uh, the material design folks have published this wonderful spec, and we sort of went through the spec and implemented it pixel by pixel and, and tried to do as, as good a job as we can. And we, we actually uh, interface a lot with the material designers, and they're quite happy with, with the uh, polish on our, our widgets. So below that is the widgets layer. So widget layer is uh, agnostic as the design language, meaning it implements various behaviors like buttons and navigation and scrolling. And then you could build on top of that different design uh, different design languages, material design being one example. Another example we have is what we call Cupertino, which are uh, widgets that are themed similar to, to what you would see on, uh, on iOS. And you could build other themes on top of that. And then below the widgets layer, there's what we call the rendering layer. So this is the, the core rendering engine, mm -hmm. which in a browser would be baked in C++, but in this system is actually built, uh, built right in Dart, and you can go in and subclass it and, and interact with it fully. And then below that, there is a, there is a C++ engine that implements um, text rendering, for example, and implements international text, bidirectional uh, text layout and things that are really quite, quite complicated and things that you rarely want to customize. Um, and then below that, there's, a, there's the underlying uh, GPU that that interfaces with. Awesome, awesome. And so one of the things I think there's an advantage to here is that all that stuff at the upper layers, that's all Dart. So if I wanted to... Uh, because the source code is obviously all available, um, I can take any piece of that and go, well, I kind of like the way this material design things, but I, I want it to like, uh, you know, come out as a triangle instead of a circle, you know, violating the design principles, of course. But uh, And I can do that because the source code's all there, right? Yeah, so this, uh, we see this a lot with our customers where they start at the top layer and they're sort of plugging together either material design or Cupertino widgets. And then as they become more sophisticated, they sort of go deeper and deeper into the stack and they create sort of more and more custom experiences and things that they didn't even really necessarily think were possible in other frameworks. And they sort of see that that's possible here and they sort of get more ideas and build really beautiful, fluid things. That that's I've been very impressed with what our customers have been able to build. Have you had a good uptake on uh, having external customers as well as internal customers? Yeah, so we have a mix of internal and external customers. Um, a couple of our internal customers have shipped. Um, so I think there was talked about at the Dart conference that the uh, that Google has a content uh, customer relationship management uh, app that is using Flutter. Um, and there are some others that are in the works. And then uh, externally, there have been some adoptions. There's this a uh, newsreader called News Voice, for example, that really has did a very beautiful app uh, using Flutter, and there are several other examples. 
So I wanted to change gears for just a moment and uh, talk about this from the uh, perspective of open source, since at Floss Weekly, that's what we're all about. Uh, how, how is Flutter open source? What, what license is used? Is all of it open source? Yes, it's open source top to bottom. Um, there are a variety of licenses that are used because we use a number of other uh, open source projects as part of it. For example, we use the the Skia library, which is uh, licensed by VSD. So mo most of the code, almost all of it, is licensed by VSD. Certainly, everything in the framework and above is is three clause VSD. Um, there's some stuff in the engine, for example, uh, you know libpng and such that has its own specialized license. Mm -hmm. uh, who who are the core developers of Flutter? Are they all uh, Google employees, or has there been some some outside contributions as well? Yeah, we've had a, a large number of contributions. So we have, I think, uh, over 100 contributors on our, our GitHub repository. You know, some people have just sent in one patch to, to fix the you know the one bug that they were really passionate about, and some people have sent in a bunch of, of, of code, and we're very appreciative of all that. Sure. Um, one of the things that that I've run into working with Android, and and you know, it's it's one of the things that. Uh, you know the IntelliJ that's been rebranded to the Android Studio. It, it is advertised is to be able to do this this hot reload or be able to change things on the fly, but never seemed to quite work right. What what is different about the new framework? How have you guys uh, moved to the point to where that just works? Yeah, so there are two key pieces of that. So the first piece is the uh, the Dart language really helps with that because of the way it's built with the uh, automatic type inference and erasable types means that you can change the code on the fly and you don't have to uh, rework a lot of typing information. You can just insert the new code and execute it uh, right away. Um, that's one piece of it. The second piece of it is the way the framework is built. So because it uses this functional reactive paradigm, you don't have to write the code to transition the UI from its current state to the state you want it to be in. You simply describe the state you'd like it to be in. And then that means that when you update your app, it just applies your up, applies the new state directly, and the framework works out how to mutate the existing thing into the new thing. In other frameworks that are built, for example, on Model View Observer, there's no obvious way to do that. You're, when you try to uh, update the app to have new code, you're in a state that the code doesn't understand, and so it doesn't have a way of changing to the state that you want it to be in. So Flutter is kind of a, a, a new experience in a way for the Dart language. Have there been any changes that have had to have been pushed upstream to Dart as a result of using it for Flutter? Yeah, so we work very closely with the Dart team. So for example, the ahead of time compiler that takes your Dart code and compiles it down to native ARM code didn't exist when we started using Flutter. So that was something that we asked the, the Dart team to build for us, and, and they did, and they did a wonderful job of it. And then something, so hot reload is another example. So that actually was an idea that originally came from the Dart team. They said, hey, look, based on the way our language is structured and the way that the, the runtime works, we could actually do this hot reload thing and it would work. And then we said, okay, that sounds cool. And they built a prototype and we tried it out. And we're like, wow, this is amazing. We definitely need to do this. And then there's a bunch of support that we did throughout the framework and in the engine and things like that to make it work well. Um, but that was, that was a collaboration with the Dart team as well. So a question has been whispered in my ear about um, Dart uh, Dart Strong Mode. And before I ask the specific question, what what is Dart Strong Mode? I'm not familiar with that term. Yeah, so Dart has, has a, at least historically, I said a very flexible type system, which meant you didn't have to write types anywhere, and everything would just sort of uh, try the operation on the object and see whether it succeeded. And if it succeeded, it would continue to execute, unlike another programming language like C++, where the compiler needs to check at every step whether the given object supports the method you're trying to use. So strong mode is saying, well, maybe Dart started out a little bit too loosey-goosey on the type side, and if we enforce a little bit more type discipline, then you get a lot of uh, performance optimizations you can do and also refactoring tools that you can build. So strong mode is about cleaning up and tightening up the type system a little bit so that uh, the compiler and the, the development tools know a bit more about what type an object is uh, at compilation or at, at tool time. And so does the Flutter framework, does it uh, specify using strong mode of Dart? Yeah, so we've been, uh, we were one of the first customers for strong mode. We've had it enabled in our project for quite a while. And we've, you know, there have been some rough edges. And we've worked with the team to sort of uh, explain what those are. And they've polished it. And, and now it's in quite good shape. Um, and so, yeah, we've been using strong mode for a long time. And we've been very happy with it. So one of our, uh, we do have an active chat room that, uh, yells at us and whispers questions in our ear. And one of them asked, 
um, the native Android and iOS developers inside Google, how did they react to Flutter? So I think Google is a uh, diverse place and different people have different reactions. So we've gotten a lot of good uptake for people who have uh, applications that they're interested in doing, say, a new version of, and they want to experiment with different frameworks to see what can work best for them. Um, for example, the the I mentioned the customer relationship management app. They uh, just had an Android app and they wanted to build an iOS version of their app. And so they started, well, rather than write a separate code base, let's try try this Flutter thing and see how it works. And they were they're quite happy with it. So I'd say mostly people are pragmatic. They're they're interested in what's going to deliver the best experience for users at the you know lowest development cost. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, so the the Dart development cycle. Uh, how does Flutter integrate with that development cycle? That cadence of releases. Does it uh, coincide or does it lag behind it? Uh, how do how do those work together? Yeah. So as I as I as been mentioned, the Flutter is currently in alpha, which means we release roughly once a week. Um, as the framework stabilizes and the APIs become frozen and we reach feature completeness, we'll probably um, slow down that cadence to maybe match more what the Dart flat platform is doing. But the details of, of what we're going to do there haven't been quite worked out yet. At the moment, when you use Flutter, you get a weekly release and you basically get to use a, a very leading edge version of the Dart SDK that's, that's released with Flutter. You, you guys have taken the adage to release early and re- release often quite to heart there, it seems. Yeah, it's been really valuable to get feedback from customers because we we have like a, a Gitter channel if you want to join and, and talk with us and give us feedback about what's working, what's not working. And we've been doing that for quite a while and, and that's really helped us basically set the direction for where we're, where we're working on things and figure out what needs to change and what needs to improve. Um, we're very receptive to that sort of feedback. Sure. Uh, so Randall just whispered into my ear something that I, I had thought of earlier. How does how does Flutter how does the Flutter framework integrate with uh, other things that would be in the in the phone? So he asked about geolocations and GPS, and I'm also curious about integration with uh, the the Google framework and services and the app stores with with them being so different between you know Google Android devices and iOS devices. How does that integration work? Yeah, so there's a plugin system where you can plug in whatever platform specific code you want. So, for example, we have a, uh, an example plugin that does geolocation. So you can there's a you write some Dart code that sends a message to the platform specific side of your app, and then you have a backend for Android and a backend for iOS that talks to the underlying platform API. And then you can talk to third party SDKs, platform interfaces, libraries, whatever you like in the platform specific part of your app. And to and, answer your and question, so, about, go ahead. I was going to say to answer your question about the App Store. So in the end, the Flutter process just creates a normal um, either APK for Android or IPA for for iOS, and you just upload it to the store in, in the normal way. So that, that's how one gets an app on the store. But there are there are things that happen, like um, for example, in the app that I work on, uh, we try to talk to other apps, and one of the things we do first is we go and ask the Play Store, "Hey, is this app installed? How how does that work with Flutter?" Yeah, so you would write that as a plugin to basically call the the Play Store APIs from the platform specific side of your co- of your app, and then to the extent you want to communicate that to your UI, you would send a message to the UI that says, "Hey, this thing has happened on the platform specific side. You know, show this UI or do that sort of thing." Are there are there examples of these plugins that are available almost like shared libraries? So other people have written perhaps some of these uh, functions that would be useful and and you know as we're used to we can just go and say well let's let's use this let's use this existing plugin is there is there good support for that in the community yet yeah so if you go to uh, pub.dartlang.org uh, you can see a list of all the Fl- flutter plugins that exist alongside with all the other dart libraries that are available as part of that ecosystem if you want to see the plugins that we've been developing and sort of as examples and some of the basic ones that a lot of people want you can go to github.com slash flutter slash plugins, and you can see half a dozen or so plugin examples. Are there are there problems with that? Can we can we use anything from Pub, or is there a, is there missing mirrors? What about um, are there licensing issues, or have all has all of that been already worked out? Yeah, so Dart is used in, in lots of different places. So Dart can run in a web browser, Dart can run in Flutter, and Dart can also run on the server. And so different packages will have different dependencies. So if you have a package that has a dependency on web browsers, obviously it's not going to work in Flutter because there isn't a web browser there. And so um, 
we're, we're trying to improve the uh, pub repository to make some of that clearer so that you can see which packages are going to work on which different uh, platforms. As for licensing, each package comes with a license file, and then you want to decide for yourself whether you like the license with that, that piece of code. I think most of the code on there is, is, has a pretty permissive open source license, but you should always double check the license file when you decide to take a dependency on a piece of code. Sure. So, uh, from what I understand, one of the uh, one of the concepts I believe in Dart is something called isolates. And uh, a question has been whispered in my ear: Do do those turn into threads on mobile? Yes. Yeah, so an isolate on uh, on mobile ends up being exactly that—a thread. So it's a place where you can run code separate from your UI in a way that doesn't block your UI. If you want to do a long-running calculation, like you want to you know, enumerate the digits of pi or, or you know, something else, that's going to be uh, computationally intensive. And then mm -hmm. similar, to like, similar to how the plugins work, you send messages back and forth to communicate with that thread. And that avoids the problems of deadlocks and complicated concurrency management. That I, I I know that the deadlocks and, and locking up the UI is one of the things that uh, many of us developers have to relearn as we come into uh, as we come into doing um, mobile development because it's just at least for me it was such a different ball game. So Flutter has some tools like that. It sounds like that that tries to help uh, those of us that may not be used to thinking in that paradigm uh, to be able to manage those things. Is that correct? Yeah. So there are a bunch of performance tools that you can use to analyze your app. So there's one of my favorites is the performance overlay, which draws a, a graph on top of your app that basically shows you the different threads that you have, how long each thread is taking to process each frame. And when you go over the frame budget, it turns red. And that's a signal that maybe you want to uh, look more closely at that frame and figure out what happened and why, why you went over the budget. Um, but yeah, the whole framework is oriented towards frames, uh, which is different from how other frameworks work. So you, you think of it as, OK, now it's time to produce the next frame of my animation. How do I do that? And so the whole system is essentially driven off animations to make them fluid and responsive. Mm -hmm. um, so when, when one of these problems does come up and we have to debug, uh, what, what does the debugging support looks like? Uh, do, does the Flutter framework have support for things like single stepping, setting watch points, watching variables? Uh, I assume all that's built into the IDE? That's right. So you can drive all of that from IntelliJ. You can set breakpoints, run your app, hit the breakpoints, edit the code, hot reload it, step to the next line, keep going. Um, it's a very sort of uh, very interactive debugging, like fixing your code kind of paradigm. So that, that's sort of the single step debugging case. There's also a lot of visualizers. So for example, there's a feature called Repaint Rainbow, which will show you all the different regions of your app that can repaint independently, and then color code them according to when they repaint, which is where a lot of the performance, uh, a lot of the ways you can tune the performance of your app is by controlling which parts of the UI repaint when. So let's let's talk a little bit more about UI. Um, did, did I understand you correctly to say that Flutter is the UI side of it is based entirely on WebKit. Is that still the case? Uh, so that was the case originally. That was the starting point. But as we've uh, as we've gone on this journey, we've sort of refactored more and more of that uh, into Dart. And so the the part that's remaining that was originally based on WebKit is the text engine. So that's the part that uh, takes your bidirectional text and uh, you know draws some of it left to right and some of it right to left and figures out how to select across uh, these sort of international character ranges. Um, understands how tie works to align based on the like the the baseline and things like that. Um, so just the core text engine is still built on WebKit, but all the rest of it has been moved up into the framework. Um, tell me, tell me about something called the Dart Observatory. What is that? The Dart Observatory is another debugging tool. So this is a a little web server that runs inside your app during development that you can uh, look at through your browser on your development machine. And it gives you all kinds of really amazing profiling tools. It can show you all the memory in your app, where it's going, what kind of objects are allocated, which ones are allocated when, by what line of code. You can also debug your whole code through there if you want. You want. You can set breakpoints, and you can sort of explore the structure of, of memory. You can explore the... You can, there's a time-oriented view where you can see a timeline of all the things that are happening, and you can see each frame marked on the timeline and say, say, oh, I see it's this part of my code that was like uh, going long and might be going over budget, or while wow, this part went really fast, maybe I should make that part fancier and things like that. And, and how does it work to access that when we're running on a, a simulator or a, an actual device that's different than the desktop we're developing on? Yeah, so generally when you uh, develop on a device, you have a cable that connects the device uh, to your computer, and then 
um, both Android and iOS have tools on the host side that will send messages back and forth across that that cable. And one of the things you can do is you can forward a port. And so to you, at, at the end, it just looks like a URL. It says like localhost at some port. And that port gets mapped mm-hmm. over to the device and then connects to the, the web server running on the device where observatory is running. So the the fact that we've taken now iOS and Android development and we've we've brought them so close together, does this allow some... Oh, I suppose we could call it Frankenstein sort of things where we, we take a uh, iOS-themed device and put it on Android or take an Android-themed device and, or a, an Android-themed app and put it on an iOS device. Are those sorts of things possible? They're possible. So you should think about whether you like that design or whether you'd prefer a different design. But yeah, so we have, a, for example, the Flutter Gallery app, which sort of shows all of our widgets and, and different things you can do with the framework. It just has a toggle button that you can switch between the Android theme and the iOS theme. And you can use that toggle button either on Android or iOS to see either theme on either app. So generally, you know, you might want to think carefully about how you want to adapt your app to each platform and make conscious decisions about when you're going to adopt a platform convention for a particular UI element or when you're going to adopt like a brand-centric uh, presentation for a piece of UI. And what you see if you look at the top apps that are winning design awards today is you see they're a mix of these things. They use sort of mostly, or some of them at least, use, use a lot of brand-centric elements. And they have a few little pieces that are platform-adapted. And all that is possible in Flutter. We've, we've made it possible for you to, to, to control where on that spectrum you want to you wanna make your app be. So even though we can, you still suggest that we should stop to think whether or not we should. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's how you avoid the dinosaurs running around. Um, let's let's talk just a little bit about animations. Can can we make the same speedy and snappy animations that you know mobile kind of has kind of has come to rely on in some ways? Um, do those work within Flutter well? Yes, yeah, so we put a lot of effort into animation. There's a very sophisticated animation system that can drive your whole app. And what's neat about it is it drives the whole app through the same. Uh, mechanism that you use to drive your app when you get new data, for example, which means you can do very sophisticated animations where things relay out and, and reflow dynamically as the animation runs. Have there been any interesting problems to solve to make that, or let's say things like scrolling, uh, work smoothly on, on both platforms with the same code base? Yeah, so we spent... A, so the scrolling thing is, was a sort of a fun adventure. So we... Uh, we film with a high-speed camera, uh, both an Android and iOS device uh, scrolling, and then we sort of measured exactly at every frame what offset it had scrolled by, and then we plotted that those points, and we gave it to Wolfram Alpha and said, Wolfram Alpha, what is the equation for this scrolling? And it came back <laughs> and gave us the equation. And then, uh, you know, then we were able to have scrolling that lined up just just exactly with what the platform convention is. So you had to go in and kind of reverse engineer each of the platforms to be able to, uh, in some ways, emulate how they should feel. Yeah, it was interesting. So on, on Android, of course, the code is open source, so you can read the algorithm they use to implement the scrolling physics. And then we compare that with what Wolfram Alpha told us. And it was fascinating that uh, there's all this code that computes what, what they're doing, but in the end, Wolfram Alpha, Alpha just says, oh, it's a third-order polynomial, and here are the coefficients. And so we ended up with just a different implementation of... Uh, something that looks visually very similar. Did, so Wolfram Alpha was able to better optimize the uh, Android scrolling code? Is that what you're telling us? <laughs> well, I think when they... I, I, I wasn't there. I didn't write the code. But if you read the code, it seems it's very like physically based. Like it, It's based on gravity and these other sort of, of notions. And I think somebody designed it with that, those in, that intent. Um, but if you end up solving the equation, it just sort of ends up being a third-order polynomial with certain coefficients. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, one of our listeners in the chat room wants to wants to know about Google's future support for Dart and Flutter. Can can you tell us anything about what's uh, on the roadmap coming for the future? It's a little hard to talk about the future. Um, it's easier to talk about what's what's happening now. So we're quite excited about Flutter, and we see it gaining momentum, and so we're very happy with that. All right. Um, at- well, I know we talked a little bit about the scrolling, but is there is there anything else that has been uh, surprising about doing this development? Anything that just caught you guys off guard that it was interesting to, to work through? 
Yeah, so I, we learned a lot about the different platform conventions, a lot more than I ever knew. So I, I didn't know all about the little subtle gestures you can do on iOS. To Even though I have an, an iPhone, I use an iPhone every day. I learned so many like cool gestures that exist in, in the platform. So one of the ones I learned about was you could tap on the top and scroll to the top of, of any app. And then when we discovered that, it was like, oh, this is interesting. Uh, we don't have our, our scrolling system is very flexible, which means you can have lots of different scrolling regions that are nested or do whatever you like. And so it wasn't obvious which was the distinguished scrolling element that should scroll to the top when you when you tap the top. And so we had to, mm-hmm. to solve those sort of problems. Um, another one was the edge swipe. So the edge swipe has a very on, on iOS has a very beautiful animation that it turns out uh, has a has a slightly different curve than every other animation in the whole system. And so we had to build a custom curve to, to match that perfectly. Um, one of one of the things that is talked about is that everything is a widget. I, I've seen that phrase used before in, in the context of Flutter. What what does that mean that everything is a widget? Yeah. So uh, normally, when people talk about widgets, they they mean something more like a UI control, like a button or a switch or a menu. But we thought, well, why does there have to be a separate thing that's like your theme? Why couldn't your theme just be a widget, right? Because a theme should be able to apply to any subtree of your UI. So you should be able to say, this part of my UI I want to be styled purple with these fonts, and this part I want to be styled, you know, blue with uh, you know shimmering effects or something like that. And so really you want to designate a, a point in your UI and say this theme affects everything below it, which is basically what a widget is doing, right? So we just sort of said, well why don't we make theme a widget? And then we're like so we we sort of repeated that process over and over and we realized that it's really powerful if everything is just one thing called a widget makes the system very composable because every component will take as a child any widget, which means you can put anything there. And then as soon as you can make, as soon as everything is a widget, that that opens up the possibilities for what you can do and how you can create reusable units of your code. Does, does that apply to, uh, to layouts as well? Yeah, so layout is another widget. So it's actually several widgets. So there's, for example, row is a, is a widget that will lay out its children horizontally um, and stack is a widget that will lay out its children one in front of the other um, coming towards you. Um, and that means you can compose in these different pieces anywhere that you like. So it's very common for a widget to take another widget as a child, which means you can put any layout there you want, as opposed to the parent committing ahead of time to saying, oh, this has to be a horizontal or a vertical layout. Hey, so uh, we're almost out of time. But I, one thing I forgot to ask you was, um, what? Uh, how, how did you get involved with Flutter? Uh, yeah, so I, I'm one of the co-founders of the project. So uh, we created this prototype that said, look, here, if we if we change these things and we uh, sort of hack things together in this way, look at this neat these neat effects we can produce. And then people got interested and said, oh, that, that looks like there's something that might be interesting there. And so then we sort of started from there and sort of uh, made it more and more into a real thing. And today it's to a point where you can actually build real apps with it. And it's very uh, it's been a very sort of gratifying journey. I bet. I bet. And how, were you primarily a mobile developer before? Uh, before, I, I worked on the rendering engine for Chrome. So I, I spent oh. a lot of time optimizing the performance of Chrome's rendering engine. Worked on WebKit before that. Um, so I had a lot of experience um, working on rendering engines, particularly for mobile. So one of the things that's actually come up in the Flutter channel is the idea of um, having a, you know, since since all all Flutter's really doing is rendering to some sort of canvas to actually having desktop apps uh, that would be driven by Flutter because all you need is a desktop canvas at some point. Is that, is, uh, actually, I guess I can't ask you if that's something you're considering because you can't talk about forward stuff, but is that, is that even feasible? Yeah, so it's definitely very technically possible, and at various times in the history of the project, we've had that working and not working. So we focus on mobile because we think mobile is a really important market, and it's where we see a lot of demand for this sort of thing. Um, but certainly getting it running on desktop, uh, similar to Electron, is something that would be possible in the future. And then I also understand there's people coming the other direction trying to make, a, like Adam is, uh, be able to take uh, basically a, a web development, so using Angular Dart on the desktop uh, as well. So hopefully we'll see something come out of those camps one way or the other, because I would love to have one language for six platforms instead of just uh, instead of just four. So that would be uh, really, re- really rather slick. Hey, like I said, we're almost out of time. Is there anything we didn't ask you that you want to make sure our audience is aware of? Um. I feel like I should have a good answer to that question, but I, nothing springs to mind. I feel like you guys asked really great <laughs> questions. 
It is the most <laughs> difficult question we ever ask our guests because then they have to go through in their mind and figure out everything we've asked and then subtract that from the list of things that they thought we should ask, and uh, it's, uh, I, I, I appreciate the difficulty I'm always putting people into at the end of the show. However, every once in a while, somebody says, we didn't ask about this thing, so I kind of like to make that a good catch-all. So uh, I, you're right, we do ask some pretty good questions. So uh, I, I'm really excited about Flutter, uh, um, uh, and, and actually, you know, I, I, it helps that, you know, my old buddy, Wim Leeler, uh, you know, brought me down to Google headquarters in Portland there uh, just last week or two weeks ago, I guess it was, and poked me at it and said, you really got to talk about Flutter more. And I went, well, that's interesting. Yes, it is interesting. So um, uh, I, I do have two uh, two questions that I have to ask every guest, especially technical guests like you. Uh, what's your favorite scripting language? Oh, I'm a Python guy. I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you're Google. Uh, I never win on a Google person. I mean, that's always going to be Python. And and how about your uh, favorite text editor? Oh, that's VI. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I lose on both. I lose on both. I win some. I mean, it's Perl and Emacs for me, of course, but uh, it's because I have a bias towards both of those. Although eventually I might be saying, you know, shebang lines that have Dart on them might be the thing that will be my favorite scripting language. That would be really, really slick. And I think actually I'm thinking about doing mobile development just because it, now it looks like it's much simpler. It looks like it's much more fun. Adam, it's been great having you on the show, talking to us about Flutter. It's big. It's huge. It's going to get bigger. And uh, I, I think we're at the right time if people want to look into this thing. Uh, Flutter Flutter.io is uh, the place to be. And you already have some videos that uh, showed up in like the last two Google IOs, as I recall. Yes, we had we had two uh, talks at Google I.O., this past Google I.O. Uh, yeah, one about awesome. sort of how to build an app and another about how to integrate Flutter into a designer developer workflow. Yeah, yeah, very cool. And you have some uh, some things that people like homework. You can do homework if you want. The the thing about building a Firebase app I thought was really cool. I haven't actually gone all the way through that, but I read through it and I went, this looks reasonable. I think I can do this. And not, so you have some really, like I said, really good documentation. So totally appreciate that. Thanks. Oh, that wasn't really a question. I guess. <laughs> Sorry, I left you dead there. <laughs> Adam, thanks for coming on the show uh, and, and telling us about Flutter. That was it. Okay. All right. Okay. That was Adam Barth with a very complicated saying goodbye. <laughs> Jonathan, save me here. What did you think? <laughs> so Flutter is interesting. Um, it it seems like they've got a lot of really nifty ideas that they've pulled together. And I, I kind of get the feeling that it's it's right on the edge, getting ready to, to, to go over the hill and, and really great, gain that critical mass that it'll uh, you know, it'll it'll be the next big thing. Um, I'll I'll definitely have to take a look at it. Um, one of the things he mentioned that really captures my attention is the ability to uh, take a Java app and a screen at a time. Uh, so I assume that that would be uh, from us working from the Java side, an activity at a time, and uh, mm -hmm. convert it over to Flutter and be able to have the two coexist. And then eventually you get to where you know all of your UI stuff is Flutter. And then you can just step over to the iOS side and say, okay, here's all of the UI, drop it in place and, and be able to, you know, do ideally minimal work to make the rest of it work around it. And that that is certainly a, a very interesting and compelling idea, not only to to avoid having to repeat the work, but it would also tend to um it would tend to give you a a more of a matching experience between the two different versions of an app. Um, again, you don't have two different teams working on it. You don't have to be continually worried about does it feel the same on each platform. So I, I think it's a, I think it's definitely a, an interesting concept. Yeah, I saw a similar discussion uh, recently about uh, uh, some some large organization taking a GWT app. I think it was some sort of mail app or something. Uh, GWT, of course, was the Google Web Toolkit, which used Java as this uh, both server side and client side language, and they changed just one element of it at a time over to Dart. And uh, it, it seemed that the code sat side by side in the same repository, and they got pretty productive being able to do that. So it sounds like, you know, Dart seems to have this nice position in the middle where it's similar enough to Java and C Sharp that uh, you don't have to spend a whole lot of time working with it. In fact, uh, the, one of the papers I read about uh, conversion of, I think it was either AdSense or AdWords, found that they could, uh, that Google internally could spin up a new developer on Dart in just a couple of weeks and get them productive with just a couple of weeks. And I'm, I have a sense that there would be this similar figure for taking uh, existing mobile app developers and moving them over to Flutter 
because it has that same uh, low barrier to entry and uh, a lot of good tooling. Uh, I tell you, the Dart tooling is amazing. The you know the code completion, especially in strong mode, because you have to type everything. You have to uh, uh, strongly type everything. Uh, that doesn't mean using your keyboard really hard. That just means <laughs> that just means actually telling the, the compiler this thing. Yeah, right. I tried strong typing once, nearly ruined my keyboard. No, right, exactly. <laughs> Uh, anyway, goofy, goofy. Anyway, so I'm excited by this. Uh, I think I'm going to be, uh, you're going to be seeing more things uh, from me about Dart and maybe about Flutter in particular over time. Uh, this seems to be uh, an up and coming thing. Uh, I know enough of, uh, uh, I, I believe enough, of, I don't know for fact, but I believe enough of the internal people at Google are fairly committed to uh, Dart and Flutter that uh, this is not going to go away anytime soon. It's not going to replace Golang. Uh, but because Golang only runs server side, it doesn't run on the browser, it doesn't run on iOS and Android yet. So, uh, but those don't compete. Golang has its own uh, niche inside Google and won't go away anytime soon either. Um, anyway, any last things before I start running down who's coming up? Dart Dart has one very very strong thing going for it, at least in my opinion. It's not Java. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, uh, because uh, Java, I, every time I've tried to learn Java, I've just given up. Uh, Dart does not have the huge volumes of bo boilerplate that you always seem to bring in uh, with the Java code. Anyway, I, I'm sorry, I hate Java. But anyway, whatever. <laughs> uh, we don't have to worry about that anymore because let's go ahead and uh, do the final parts of the show before I uh, lose my time here. So uh, coming up next week, Cockpit, which is administering your Linux system via the web. Redis, which is the most popular in-memory key value store. Hyperledger, which is blockchain technology. They'll think of Bitcoin, but for everything. Jenkins, which is the leading CI/CD server. It's a fork of Hudson. Uh, container Chip, which is cross-platform to deploy and manage containers. Uh, the uh, All Things Open .org show is coming up uh, towards the end of the year. I'm attending that, but I also want to have uh, the coordinators come on this show and talk about what that's actually been. Uh, it's, it's been going on for five years, and I had no idea. Actually, somebody yesterday at the Pearl Conference said, I'm going to be keynoting at that, and I go, whoa, and I didn't even know about the show. And there it is. Somebody's keynoting at it. So I want to go up to her and tell her, hey, you know, by the way, I'll be there too. Uh, following that, LibreOffice. Uh, it's been updated a lot over the last five years since last time we had them on. Kazoo, which is cloud telephony, uh, also has been updated since five years ago when I had them on last. Uh, and I just want to say, I generally don't want to have the same guest on twice. But I tell you, after five years, the project's changed so much that they're still around. Hey, come on back, guys. <laughs> we we want to hear from you again, you know. Uh, email me, Merlin at Salinas.com, right? Okay, two more things. Hiawatha Web Server, haven't had them on before. It's a security-focused uh, web server. Uh, Crail, which is a high-performance storage and networking, so uh, for uh, basically large data, large computation data, stuff like that. Didn't add anybody since last week, but, you know, I tell you, with, uh, with 11 shows still in the pipeline, I'm not really too critical right now about filling it in. Uh, I'm here at the Pearl Conference, going to be picking up some new people here this week as well. If you want to find out how I'm doing, or if you have uh, wanted to find out if I'm already working on a particular uh, guest, uh, go to twit.tv slash floss, which is the homepage for this show, and uh, linked from there, you'll see who's our upcoming guest. There's just a nice uh, little link to a Google Doc there. Uh, if you have somebody that uh, you want on that list that isn't on there right now, have the community coordinator or the uh, project leader email me, Merlin at Stonehenge.com. My email address is right there. You can't believe the amount of spam I've gotten because I've had that same email address for 20 <laughs> 20 years, 20 years. Uh, we have a live stream at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. I was going to say on Tuesday, but that's just today. We are switching to Wednesdays next week. Wednesdays for the foreseeable future, which will be pretty fun. Uh, apparently the uh, Twit Network wants the Tuesday slot for something else now. And I do whatever they tell me to. You follow us on Floss Weekly on Google Plus and at, at Floss Weekly on Twitter. You can follow me personally at Randall L. Schwartz on Google Plus, and that's tweeted over to at Merlin, M E R L Y N, on Twitter. Uh, I'm going to be in Dragon Con in September. I'm actually giving a talk on why Dart should be your next programming language, about an hour long talk on the uh, EFF track there, and also about three or four other panels. They seem to keep lining me up for more and more panels all the way through. And I'm also going to be, as I said, at allthingsopen.org, which is coming up, uh, I believe it's October. And it's going to be in the research triangle somewhere. Uh, that's all the plugs I've got. Jonathan, anything you want to plug? <laughs> English, English, please. <laughs> uh, no, no, no conferences or conventions coming up for me, but you can follow me at, uh, let's see, where is it? JP Bennett or JP underscore Bennett on Twitter. And uh, I tweet about occasionally politics, but mostly tech and security things there. 
Okay. Well, Jonathan, thanks for coming back so quickly. And uh, thanks for, uh, when, while my, uh, my Wi-Fi connection was just dying horribly, thanks for uh, stepping in and being my, uh, my uh, allowing me to whisper in your ear to give uh, more questions so that we can keep the show going. really appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. I enjoyed it. All right. And we'll see you all again next week, hopefully from a better connection on Floss <laughs> Weekly.